in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Y'all are singing beautiful this morning. You know what we might do? We might just have you guys go from here and then go ahead and climb into the choir uh, at the end of the Sunday school and then we'll sing that song. That was beautiful. Um, so good to see everybody this morning. Happy Mother's Day to all of our moms that are present. There is no way that a person could in a single statement describe who and what moms are because there's so much that describes who they are. I was thinking this morning as we were driving to church, it was really good instead of fighting with Carmen, I was complimenting Carmen. <laughs> you guys are on top of your game this morning. I was describing to her you know, because you know how it is. Um, thank you for being a great mom. Oh, no, you know. They always talk themselves down. And, uh, and I'm like, no, I'm serious. And then I started naming off some of the things that transpired over the last 30 years. And, uh, uh, and then I finished it off with, yes, you're a good mom, and I'm right this time. <laughs> right? So happy Mother's Day to all of you all that are moms, and we thank the Lord for you. I know that many times you like to stay in the background and you don't like to be recognized, but you are why we are here. And we thank you for that. Thank you so much. Happy Mother's Day. I hope it's the best for you today. Brother Mark. Good to see everybody today, thank you for being here. You know, Brother Dan said he was right. And, you know, guys, keep in mind, it's, it's not that we always have to be right. It's that everybody else has to be wrong, okay? So as long as, as, long as that works out. Hey, good to see you today. Thank you all for being here. And do hope you ladies have a happy Mother's Day. Uh, we'll, we'll look at uh, John chapter 12 for a quick nugget. We'll actually be in John 11, but we'll start in John 12. As far as uh, new prayer requests, that we didn't have anything on the list but I'm going to try and see if I get this right. Was it Angie Moore? Is that right? All right. Angie had a heart attack this, the, earlier this week. Is that right? Yes. Damn. Okay. Earlier this week. Just out of curiosity, while you're finding John 12, has anybody in here had a heart attack before? I, 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 see, I see a few hands. Okay. You, you who have had one, you can pray for Angie in, in a way that I can't because I've never experienced that. I've had friends and family that have that's happened to but I've never had it happen but you guys that raised your hand you can pray for her in, in, in a way that I can't so let's remember her during this time all right so we'll uh, go to the Lord in prayer to open up and then take a quick look at John 11 and John 12 and then we'll move on Heavenly Father thank you Lord for the time we have to be together here today I pray you'll bless our time make it profitable uh, the, the Bible says that uh, when we meet together, we read and study your word, we pray, we give praise to your name. It says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. So we're going to be looking at scripture today. And in some way, somehow, that's going to profit our lives. And I pray you'll speak to each person here today with exactly what they need. Because there's a lot of needs represented in, in a crowd this size. There, there's somebody here who needs to be encouraged they're discouraged today there's somebody here who's maybe depressed fighting some 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 things that's going on in their life there's somebody here that's got some sickness going on in, in either their body or uh, in their in their family there, there's somebody here that uh, is despondent somebody here needs direction they've got a, a big decision to make something that 
could maybe uh, alter the course of their life, and, and they, they need direction. So there's a lot of needs here, but thank you that we can come to you, we can pray, we can praise your name, we can study your word, and you can meet these needs. I want to pray specifically for Angie with this heart attack, that you would uh, give her healing, give her restoration, help her with uh, potentially therapy and rehab after this, and restore her back to health, and I just, just lift her name up to you in prayer. I ask you to be with her. Be with all our needs, um, most of them unspoken, things close to our hearts. And bless our time here together. Help Brother Dan as he opens up the Word of God here in just a few minutes and, and uh, preaches to us. And just bless him, speak through him, give us what we need today. May it be a, a good time, and may, may we be able to say we're glad we were here this morning. Thank you for all our mothers. Bless them today in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so uh, Mary and Martha. We're going to look at something about Mary and Martha today. So I want to find out how many, how many ladies in here have a sister. Can I see? Raise them up high. I want to see how many ladies. So there's a lot, a lot of ladies that have a sister. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go into something about Martha and Mary. They were sisters. And I'm, I may be wrong about something. Because, uh, A, I'm not a lady, B, I don't have a sister, and C, I don't identify as a lady. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this, just a guy, just a, I'm just a goober with a microphone, all right? I'm just reading through the Bible here. I see Mary, I see Martha, and I see some things, but I might be wrong. So you ladies who have a sister, that you raise your hand. I implore you, please study, study this out this week. Look at the, th the three passages where Martha and Mary are mentioned. There's that number three again, keeps popping up, doesn't it? Martha and Mary mentioned three times in the Bible together, always with Jesus. And uh, you, you, you that have a sister, look this over, study this out. If I'm wrong, come up next week and tell me, because I'm here to learn just like everybody else, okay? But I'm just going to give you what a geber with a microphone thinks reading through the Bible. All right, so John chapter 12 um, now, John chapter 12, Lazarus has already been, been raised from the dead. And um, we, see, we see in verse, we'll just start with verse 1. It says, Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. So now Jesus had went away after he raised Lazarus from the dead. He spent some time away. He's now come back. To Bethany. It's right before the Passover. Remember, the events of this story happened right shortly before Jesus died. Within three months, it could have even been within a couple of months. So, everything that you've ever heard about, Je that you know about Jesus, his miracles, his teachings, where he went, who he interacted with, all that happened before the, the, what's going on in this story. So, he comes back to Bethany, verse 2, there it says, There they made him a supper, and Martha, what? Served. In Luke chapter 10 is where we first see Mary and Martha. And it says, Martha was cumbered about much, what's the next word? Serving, I heard it, much serving. So when we see Martha, we see a lady that's serving, a servant. Where do we, where do we always see Mary? At all three times that we see Mary with Jesus, where do we see Mary? Well, in Luke chapter 10, which we're not there, but it said, and she had a sister called Mary, which also sat where? Jesus' feet. All three times that we see Mary, guess where she is? Now, let's look back in John, John 12. You were in verse 2. There they made him a supper, and Martha served. Uh, verse 3. Then Mary took a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the... So Mary, I'm sorry, is, is again at Jesus' feet. So Mary, Mary and Jesus never have a conversation either. Martha and Jesus have conversations. Mary never does. Uh, Mary has a, one short monologue with Jesus, but she never has a dialogue. Mary is, is always sitting at Jesus' feet every time we see her. Martha's up, busy, serving. By the way, nothing wrong with either one of those things. Those, those, both of those things are, are, are very needed. Both of those things are good. But let's, let's go on. Let's go back to John chapter 11. So just turn back to John 11. And now this is before Lazarus has been raised from the dead. And Jesus has come from, remember over here at the Dead Sea, 
about a few miles north on the other side of the river where John was baptizing, where Jesus was hiding out. Basically, he's in the wilderness. And he's coming. He's really close. To Beth- if this is Jerusalem right here, Bethany would be about right here. And he, he's, Jesus is really close, so he's probably about where Brother Larry's sitting right there. He's real close to Bethany. And Martha and Mary hear about it, and it says in verse 20, Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went out and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. So Martha and Mary are splitting. They're hitting Splitsville now. Martha is going out to meet Jesus alone. She's having some some me time with Jesus. All right? Verse 21. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. Later on, Mary's going to go meet Jesus alone. Just Mary. Martha goes back and gets her and brings her back. And Mary goes to meet Jesus alone. So here's a question. Did you and I, this past week, have some alone time with Jesus? Did we get together every day and open up his word and read it? Did you take your, your, your prayer requests and the things that, uh, close to your heart? Did you talk to him this week? Martha and Mary had some alone time with Jesus. That's our main nugget there to, to, get, to get out of this story. But let's go on right quick. Now, Martha said, Martha met Jesus. She didn't say, hey, good to see you, you know, high five him, fist bump. No, she goes, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. I want you to find verse 32, but don't lose track of verse 21. But look at verse 32. This is Mary coming to Jesus. Look in the middle of the verse. Well, I'll start at the first verse. Then when Mary was coming to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down where? Third time. And then she's saying unto him, Lord. Find the word Lord in that verse. Go back to verse 21, find the word Lord. Can you see both of those? I know it's one eye on one verse, one eye on the other. I'm going to read it real slowly. Try to bounce back between both verses as I read what both Mary and Martha say to Jesus. All right? Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. You see anything strange about that? Word for word, isn't it? What is the probability they would both come to Jesus and the very first thing they say when they see him is the exact same thing word for word? What is the probability of that? Well, let's see. Verse, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, back, back in verse 21, Martha says this to Jesus. By the way, is that true? Did Jesus have to be there for Lazarus not to have died? How many people did Jesus raise from the dead? Oh, it's at number three again. Keeps popping up. Um, Jesus, no, Jesus didn't have to be here for, for Lazarus to have been raised. In fact, did Jesus do a raising of the dead where he was not there with the person? Yeah. Did that happen before or after this event? Before. Every, everything about Jesus happened before. This is right before he died on the cross. Mary and Martha knew about that. They had heard all the stories. They, they knew. Jesus didn't have to be there. So what, what Martha and Mary were saying is presupposing something about Jesus. It really wasn't true. Good thing we never do that, do we? Uh, verse 28. And when she had said so, this is Martha, she went, Martha went her way and called Mary her sister. What's the next word? Sisters, do you ever have secrets? Just you and your sister? Sisters, huh? Do you? That word in, in the Greek is lathra, used four times in the New Testament. It means exactly what you think. It means in, done in secret. This is a good translation of that word. It's exactly what it means. She called Mary, her sister, secretly, saying, The Master has come and calleth for thee. Here's where I need some help, ladies. In, if you read the dialogue with Martha and Jesus up above, they have a very good dialogue about the resurrection. Man, it's worth reading. Brother Dan, you could preach for months on this, these few verses, this dialogue of the resurrection. If you have a loved one, brother, does some good verses. Good verses there on the resurrection. You will see that loved one again if they died in Christ. Well, Martha calls Mary secretly, saying, The Master is coming, calleth for thee. Jesus never called for Martha. So what's going on here? And then, or called for Mary, I'm sorry. And then Mary comes and she says the exact same thing to Jesus that Martha had said. Here's what I'm going to propose. 
I'm going to propose that Martha and Mary had conspired together. Now, sisters, you would never do this, right? But Martha and Mary did it. They conspired together, and they wanted to kind of lay a little bit of a guilt trip on Jesus for not being there on time. Jesus, see, Jesus was late. He, 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 Jesus kind of blew it. Right, Because Lazarus is dead by this time, by the time they're talking to him. I thought God was always on time, but uh, this is a case where he wasn't. Jesus kind of blew this one. And, and Martha and Mary, I think, were conspiring together to lay a little guilt trip on Jesus. And they said in verse 21 and verse 32, word for word, the exact same thing to Jesus. And I think maybe, maybe that's what was going on. But I need some help. Ladies, you have sisters. Would you ever do such a thing? And it's a good thing, by the way, when we pray, we never try to lay a guilt trip on God, do we? Because he didn't do something for us when we thought he should, or he was not on time when we thought he should have been on time, or something didn't go our way. We never go to him and lay a guilt trip on him, do we? We wouldn't do that. But man, Martha and Mary, I'm not too sure about them. All right, so what's our nugget here today? Man, a lot of stuff in this story. We could spend months trying to trying to unravel it all. But did you spend some time with Jesus this week, like Martha and Mary? They had private time, just them and Jesus. Did you do that this past week? If you didn't, start in John 11 and John 12. Look in Luke 10. Read, read, this, read these stories. That give you, give you a place to start. Spend some time with Jesus this week, every single day. It'll, it'll be worth it to you. Brother Dan? Amen. Wow. By the way, just in case, he was being sarcastic when he said Jesus blew it. You better unravel that. <laughs> uh, but, you know, humanly speaking, it's so easy to get caught up in our humanness that a lot of times, and we've got great examples in the Bible where good people, good people, they, they get caught up even after, not even after, even being with Christ. They, they act in such a way that many of us find ourselves acting knowing. We know these stories. We have studied these stories, and um, it's, it, just, it, just, it just tells me that I'm not there yet. I've got a ways to go, and I will not achieve that until I get to heaven. But I appreciate that. And we know that God didn't blow it. He, uh, he knew exactly what He was doing. He has a reason for... Everything that he does, precisely down to every step that he takes. And in our lives, I'm looking out at a, uh, everybody's faces here and, and so many individual situations come to mind that some have shared, uh, some the staff pray for on a weekly basis, and in every single one of those situations, God has a specific purpose and a reason as to why He even allows you and I to go through what we go through on a daily basis. And we know that if we are a believer, there's nothing that takes place in our lives that hasn't first been allowed to pass through God's hand. And he will allow it. Now, he is not the author of evil. He is not the author of the pain and the anguish. A lot of times, there's, even this week, um, I had a young person ask me, because it had been asked of them, why would God, because I had mentioned in something that I was teaching, that God created Lucifer. And that sends shudders down our spine when we hear that. But when you study 
the Bible, God created Lucifer and, he, and, and millions of angels, and He created them with the ability to choose. He gave them each a will. And so the question was asked, why did God create Satan? Why did He make Satan? I said He didn't. He made Lucifer. Lucifer was a cherubim. And he was so close to the Lord. When you read Ezekiel, the wording is used of Lucifer that he was the sum of it all. God used that word. He said that, that he was almost perfect. And the reason that he was the sum of it all, and the reason that he had such a key uh, place where he was placed, was because on his body was every beautiful stone that you can imagine. And the reason that his body consisted of all that is because of his close proximity to God, he reflected the glory of God. Very interesting study, and someday we might do that. And so everything that he did was a reflection of who God was. And God created him to reflect his glory. Did you know that you and I, that our purpose as believers in Christ is to reflect God's glory? We are to be representatives. And we can do that when we trust that the God that saved us, the God that orchestrated everything in our life so that we can individually know Him as a personal Savior. He wants us to reflect that glory. So nothing is going to happen to us that He doesn't allow. And it has a purpose. I imagine myself on the potter's wheel. You have heard that. There's, there's even a reference to that in Scripture where we are the clay, and He is the potter. And He applies sometimes a little bit of pressure, and that pressure is to form us to be more like Him every day. It's not comfortable. It's very uncomfortable. I don't like it when things are pointed out in my life that aren't right, because I want to be right. Is that not true? I don't like it when Sunday after church, Carmen says, you know, um, on that one thing that you said, um, you could have clarified a little better there. That, that, that's not comfortable, but it's for my good. She doesn't want me to look like an idiot. <laughs> and I'm very grateful for that. <laughs> She's a true helpmeet. Or else she just let me ramble on and do whatever, I, whatever comes to, to, to my mind. So God lets certain things happen in our life, and it's, it's a beautiful thing. Lazarus, you know, and, and it's so neat. I love that story. Um, God had to say Lazarus' name, because had he not, everybody in that graveyard would have risen. He had to be specific. So it's very, 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 very neat. Wow. All right. Thank you, Brother Mark. I appreciate that. Um, Mrs. Orgelina, who many times comes to our Sunday school class, she's also part of the Spanish ministry. She had an operation on Friday. She's doing much better. For those of you that know her, um, and she's, she's doing well. And uh, I'm working with the Spanish ministry and some of the folks there. They are seeing to her and taking care of her and, and, and keeping an eye on her. And that's a good thing. And so they're growing and they're learning and it's a wonderful, beautiful thing. We're finishing up on the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. We, we saw about how the Holy Spirit is referenced is in certain symbols, um, which, by the way, I don't have the sheets, the verse sheets this morning because there was zero communication with my computer and the printer. And I am not a technologically savvy guy. And so I'm going to have to rely on somebody that knows more than I do about that. But it would not communicate, so I could not print that up. So 
that being said, I will go slower this morning with using my verses. And it's come to this. We're going to have to open our Bible. Uh, you know, I'm just being facetious here. But anyway, um, we were finishing that up. And there was, there was one that I did not cover last week. And that was um, the Holy Spirit has often been um, referenced as an endowment or clothing in Scripture. Take your Bible to, the, to Luke chapter 24 and verse 49. Luke 24, 49, the Bible says this, And behold, Christ says, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be, and then it uses the word endued, with power from on high. And that word that it gives, it gives us the idea that he he clothes us with the Holy Spirit, indicating empowerment to proclaim the gospel. So for those of us that get really nervous about what would I say should the opportunity present itself for me to witness for Christ, you know, because we hear that often, and in our church, I, be, I, I believe... I believe in my heart of hearts, it is not, like if we see that someone that maybe doesn't go or, or somebody that doesn't partake as much in proclaiming the gospel, it's not because we don't want to. A lot of times is because we feel inadequate, we feel like we're not prepared, or, we, or, or, or we're just flat out scared. <laughs> we, we, we just... You know, what, what am I going to say? I'm a very shy person. I, I, I don't talk to strangers, you know. And that is not for everybody. The Holy Spirit has extended a certain amount of gifts and to everyone different gifts many times. And so while we are to speak when we should, uh, for some of us it comes easier than others. That is in fact the case. Um, it's nothing for me to step onto an elevator, and I learned this years ago. You, don't, you know how nobody, no, normally everybody steps into the elevator, and they turn around, and they, you know, you back up, you know, and you get in place for the next person. I love just walking in and letting the door close behind me and say, well, guys, you're probably wondering why we called this meeting, <laughs> you know. It, it does a lot of things. It breaks the ice, and then, you know, do they think you're an idiot? There's, there is that possibility. <laughs> there is that possibility. But it will stick out in their mind um, should you ever need to talk about it, or they'll say, something's different about that guy. Yeah, something's very different about that guy. <laughs> and you have, you have a platform and an audience to, to speak of. So the Holy Spirit does that clothing, and He will clothe you as well with what you need to know at the appropriate time. There's times to speak and there's times to hush. There's times to just be present and, and, uh, and the Holy Spirit will take care of that. So, all right, that, that leads us to the nature of the Holy Spirit as it is revealed by certain names, descriptions, and titles. As I'm studying this, this, is, this excites me because it opens up all kinds of possibilities that perhaps we didn't know of. The following that we're going to look at is only a partial listing of the names of the Holy Spirit as He is referred to by, a, referred to by approximately 18 times in the Old Testament and... 39 times in the New Testament. So, let's jump in, all right? Number one, the Holy, he's referred to as the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. Some 91 occurrences. The Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. Now, there's no difference between these terms in the original language the Bible was written in. So we must not read some strange or spooky connotation into the term ghost in relation to the Holy Spirit. That's just how he's referred to 
in, in those instances some 91 times. Number two, he's referred to as the Spirit some 99 different occurrences. He's referred to as the Spirit. Number three, the Holy Spirit is referred to as the Spirit of His Son. The Spirit of His Son. He's referred to as that one time in Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 6, where we read, And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. This excited me. Have you ever heard the expression when you're around somebody and they're just very pleasant to be around. And when that person leaves, you hear the expression, boy, she has a, a very pleasant spirit, or it's just so nice to be around that person. Um, it is said here in Scripture when he says, and because ye are sons, in this case, the reference could also be daughters, but you are children of God, you are sons. Because you're sons, God the Father sent forth the literal spirit of His Son, Jesus Christ, who He was, that magnetism, that, um, that aura, if you would. Wherever He walked, His spirit was different. Even though, as far as appearance goes, he was like a, the common man. He, he could be mistaken in a crowd were it not for his spirit was different. The Bible says here that uh, God the Father has sent forth the spirit of his Son. And guess where he's placed that? Into you, into your heart, and into my heart. Into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, and we learned uh, not too long ago when Brother Johnny Pope preached that many times, you know, you hear references of it being, um, uh, being referred to as daddy or, or things like that, it, when in fact, when you study that word Abba Father, it gives more of the idea of when our Father speaks, we say, we have the attitude of, yes, Lord, whatever you ask me to do, I will do. And so, isn't that a beautiful thing? That spirit. See, a lot of times I think we use these terms and they're wonderful terms, they're beautiful terms, but sometimes we use them so much that they tend to mean less and less with the use. Or sometimes we don't even think about it. But in you and I, as we're walking about, the spirit that was in Christ is in us. Now you say, I know who I am. And there ain't no way that they don't compare. Well, I beg to differ because I just read that in the Scripture. And if God says it, I believe it, and you've heard it, and that settles it for me. You may not feel it, you may act not like that sometime, but God says that He has placed the Spirit of His Son in you. Isn't that amazing? Uh, number four, you have the reference of the Spirit of holiness. It appears one time, Romans chapter 1. In Romans chapter 1, in verse 4. When we read in verse 1, in order to give us some context, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, and then in quote, uh, or in parentheses, which he had promised to four by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, and he says, concerning his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power, 
according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. So God the Father declares that his son is to be the, according to the spirit of holiness. And you have that reference there to the Holy Spirit. I'm studying this. This is not the first time I've studied uh, this subject of the Holy Spirit. And I'm studying this again as I'm going through it. And I marvel and I'm amazed at everywhere in my life the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God shows up. It just, it just, it blows my peanut brain. It just blows it to pieces. And everywhere I look, number, uh, number five, we have uh, an occurrence in 1 John. I won't read that one. And we have that occurrence that, that refers to the Holy Spirit as the Holy One, capital One. Um, in ver uh, number six, we have 25 occurrences of the Holy Spirit being referred to as the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God. And later on, we could probably, I'll, I'll share these verses with you, but there's just a whole host. From Genesis 1-2, where I read in Genesis 1-2, let me show you real quick, um, where it says in verse 2, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. So you have from Genesis 1, where, where, where God created heaven and earth, you have the Spirit involved in that, and the Spirit of God moves in creation to be part of all this, all the way through 1 John chapter 4 and verse 2, where he refers to the Spirit of God as well. Wow, time flies. Number seven, we have the reference to the Spirit of the Lord. And it appears some 31 different times. The Spirit of the Lord. Number eight, the Spirit of the Lord God. One time it appears in Isaiah. You have, number nine, the Spirit of Christ. It appears twice in Romans and also in 1 Peter. You have, number next, the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Appears one time in Philippians. You have the Spirit of His Son, which appears in Galatians. You have, uh, number next, the Eternal Spirit that appears in Hebrews 9. And time will never allow me in this study, to touch on the entirety of Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 14, where the Bible says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? I mean, that's powerful, powerful wording, but he refers to there as um, the, the Spirit, the eternal, the eternal Spirit. Number, thir uh, number 13, I believe, we have the Spirit of Wisdom. The Spirit of Wisdom. It occurs three different times. So you know where Proverbs talks about seeking wisdom above all? When you're, when you, when you're seeking wisdom, you're actually... Wisdom belongs to the Holy Spirit. And you and I have that Spirit. So we have that wisdom if we'll just listen to the Spirit and be guided and led by the Spirit. In, ver in number 14, we have the reference of the Spirit of wisdom and revelation. And revelation, it appears one time in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 17. It, number next we have the Spirit referred to as the Comforter. Now we hear that term a lot, referenced a lot, but it only appears in Scripture four times. Four times, the Comforter. It appears in John 14 um, and verse 16. 
uh, and then also in verse 26, and then you have chapter 15, verse 26, and then chapter 16 and verse 7. Um, wow. Uh, number next, we have the Spirit referred to as the Spirit of Truth. He literally is the Spirit of Truth. Four times, four occurrences. Number next, the Spirit of Life, Romans 8, 2. Number next, He's referred to as the promise of the Father one time. Then He is referred to as the promise of my Father one time. And then I love this, and of course right now this means so much to me because my son and his wife are in the very process of adoption. Yesterday we stole away and got to hold uh, these two little ones, uh, a boy and a girl, and uh, they're just now four pounds. I mean, they're just little t tiny. His foot, Liam's foot, is only as big as my thumb. And they're just, you know, you don't want to touch them because you're afraid you're going to break them. And they're in the process of adoption. And this means so much as you're reading Romans uh, chapter 8, which is a beautiful verse in Romans 8 and verse uh, 2, where the Bible says this, um, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ, Jesus hath made me free. And this verse, we all. Speaking of something to unpack, this verse says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. You and I, having the Holy Spirit within us, that Spirit of life, which we find in Christ Jesus, has made us, has made us free from the law of sin and the law of death. We are no longer dead in our trespasses and sin. We've been made free of that. And we've also been made free. Now, it's not a sinless perfection, but we are no longer bound and enslaved to sin because of the spirit of life that dwells in us. So amazing, so beautiful. The spirit of adoption, spirit of life, the promise of my Father, the, uh, the spirit of glory it's referred to, the spirit of grace and supplication, and then by itself the spirit of grace, one occurrence. The spirit of counsel and might. The spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Verse, um, or 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 13. The spirit of faith, he's referred to. And then the spirit of understanding in Job. All those references to the Holy Spirit of God. He shows up everywhere. He is involved in Everything from creation all the way to revelation. You see the Holy Spirit work, doing His work. He is such an integral part of your life and of my life. And to think, we enjoy, we get to enjoy the advantage and the benefits of having that in our heart. And the question to us today is how much... Have you availed yourself this past week of all of this that is in you? Unfortunately, ashamedly, many times I would have to hang my head and say, I haven't taken advantage of this power, of this presence, of this beautiful presence as much as I should have. It is there for each and every one of us. Father, we love you. Thank you, Holy Spirit of God, for being in us, working through us. We love you because of it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All righty. Lord bless you. We'll see you in just a few moments. Again, happy Mother's Day.